It is the autumn of 1607. At this desolate place, a few miles downstream from the thriving port of Boston on the east coast of England, a small group of tired and anxious people are waiting, illegally, for a ship. They have travelled from the village of Scrooby in Yorkshire, more than 60 miles away, and they are on their way, or so they hope, to Holland. These people are totally anonymous, but far from ordinary, very far indeed. As they see it, they're doing God's work, and quite simply, nothing short of death will deflect them from their purpose. As it happens, their hopes on this particular day were to be dashed. Suddenly, and without warning, the magistrate's men swept over the bank, and the brave travellers were surrounded and arrested. There was to be no journey that day, except to jail in Boston. But that meant nothing to these people, Thirteen years later, after many similar episodes of persecution, imprisonment, secret flight and terribly dangerous seafaring, they were to make landfall in a strange country that would one day become known as the land of the free. Their bravery, their love of liberty, of religious freedom, helped shape that land, helped to create the traditions of justice and democracy on which the world's most powerful nation is so firmly built. Today, this lonely monument commemorates that initial sad betrayal here at Scotia Creek for just one reason, the identity of these uncompromising travelers. Now we know the meaning of their journey and history has given them an unforgettable name. The story begins at the end of the 16th century as the reign of the mighty Queen Elizabeth drew to a close. Her Elizabethan age had been particularly exciting in science, in trade, in exploration, in religion, in politics, and perhaps above all in the arts. This was the age of Shakespeare, Johnson and Marlowe, of the gallant Sir Walter Raleigh. It was the age of expansion, of enlightenment, and in general, of increased freedom of thought. And among all these exciting changes, one event had perhaps more impact than all the others, the translating of the Bible into English. Imagine its impact. Now, for the first time, ordinary people were given immediate and very personal access to the scriptures. Suddenly, family and friends could meet to read, to worship and to debate. Indeed, out of this fundamental change grew both the practice of family prayer and an increasingly independent approach to religion and its meaning. Almost inevitably, a reaction to the established church set in, and this often expressed itself as a leaning towards greater clarity and greater simplicity of worship. The reformation of the church had been started by Elizabeth's father, Henry VIII, but now as a new era dawned, many people felt it had not gone far enough. Worship still seemed to them to be too formal and too ritualistic. This Puritan tradition went back more than a hundred years, but now there were people who wanted still more and still more radical change. These zealous reformers were known as the separatists, and they wanted, simply, to withdraw from the Church of England and begin their own church. Their keynote came from St Paul, who had urged the members of the early church to set themselves apart, to come out from among them and be ye separate and touch not the unclean thing. They wanted the freedom to worship in their own way, without priests or bishops to come between them and their God. Inevitably, such beliefs would lead them to confrontation with the church and the crown. <laughs> 
And so it was not surprising that the simple piety of this approach found favor with many of the country clergy whose parishes were far removed from the seats of power of the established church. The founding fathers of the separatist movement lived within a surprisingly small area of England at a point where the counties of Nottinghamshire, Lincolnshire and Yorkshire meet. Theirs was an unassuming collection of towns and villages far from the mainstream of Elizabethan life and yet it was the spawning ground for a reformist movement led by men and women of incredible courage whose passionate beliefs and sense of justice would later provide the bedrock values for the early settlers in the New World. A few miles from the Great North Road, then the main north-south artery of England, lies the village of Babworth in Nottinghamshire, and it is here that the pilgrim story begins. Hidden from the main road, at the end of a narrow winding lane, is the parish church of All Saints, built in 1290. In 1586, the parson here was Richard Clifton. Like many of the leading characters in this story, Clifton had studied at Cambridge, where he had come under the influence of the charismatic preachers Thomas Cartwright and Robert Troublechurch Brown. And one of the people who came to hear Clifton preach was William Brewster, regarded by many as the real founder of the Pilgrim Church. It was he who, above all others, gave the pilgrim adventure its backbone, its brain, and its conscience. He was a kindly, gentle, unassuming man, much loved and respected by poor and rich alike. He was the son of the postmaster of Scrooby, and he lived in Scrooby Manor House. The building we see here today is just part of one wing of the original manor house, which was renovated in about 1750. But the earliest reference to a building being here occurred in 1207, when King John ordered French wine to be sent to Scrooby for his half-brother, the Archbishop of York. King John himself stayed here in 1212. In fact, over the years, many illustrious people have stayed in this house. In 1530, when Cardinal Wolsey fled in disgrace from the court of Henry VIII, he stayed here during the month of September. In 1541, Henry VIII himself stayed here overnight and held a privy council. William Brewster Sr. was appointed bailiff and receiver of the Archbishop of York's estates here in Scrooby in 1575. Thirteen years later, he was given an additional position, that of Master of the Queen's Posts. He was responsible for the safe accommodation of Crown messengers using the Great North Road between London and Scotland. In 1590, Brewster Sr. died and was succeeded in all his duties by his now celebrated son, William, who was later to hold separatist meetings in the manor house here. Like Clifton, William Brewster studied at Cambridge and came under the influence of Troubled Church Brown. After a period of service under William Davison, one of Queen Elizabeth's most trusted diplomats, Brewster returned to Scrooby a committed separatist and soon joined Clifton's congregation at Babworth. In the early 1600s, another important figure in the separatist movement emerged, William Bradford. William was born in the winter of 1589 in the village of Osterfield, two miles north of Scrooby. The parish registers show that he was baptized in the medieval parish church, St. Helena's, on the 19th of March, 1590. The Bradfords were a farming family, but William was said to have been a weak and sickly boy, not suited to a farming life. He was, in fact, more interested in studying, though he received only the rudiments of a formal education. None of this obscured the fact that he was a highly intelligent and perceptive young man. William Bradford was, in fact, the one man in the separatist movement who, with no university education and from modest beginnings, was to rise to a position of great prominence as one of the leading figures of 17th century New England. He was the governor of Plymouth Colony almost continuously from 1621 until his death in 1657. <laughs> 
And so Bradford, Brewster and many others came to Babworth Church from the surrounding districts to join Richard Clifton in an act of worship which was both simple and sincere. In those days, this road was the main highway, and for Clifton's followers, it was the last few yards of their long walk from neighboring villages along the Pilgrim Way. In 1950, this chalice was discovered under the floor of Babworth Church by workmen doing repairs here. They didn't quite know what it was. They fetched the rector who realised it was silver and probably been buried at the time of Oliver Cromwell. And this was the actual cup made in 1593 when Richard Clifton was rector here that he used for giving communion every Sunday morning and that the pilgrims took their communion from. Richard Clifton was continually harassed by the church authorities and was eventually accused before the Chancery Court of being a non-conformist and a non-subscriber. The offences of which he was accused were probably failing to wear the cap and surplice during services, omitting the sign of the cross during baptism and failing to bow at the name of Jesus. In 1605, he was deprived of his living. In 1602, across the River Trent in Lincoln, another ex-Cambridge man, the separatist John Smith, was dismissed by his employer, the Bishop of Lincoln, for preaching strange doctrines and forward preaching of his Puritan views in church. Fortunately, help was at hand from, as it happened, a most unlikely source. Not far to the northwest of Lincoln, on the River Trent, is the town of Gainsborough. For more than 150 years, civic authority over Gainsborough had been in the hands of the Borough family. They lived in Gainsborough Old Hall, a magnificent timber-framed medieval manor house. In 1596, the hall was bought by the Hickmans, a colourful and energetic family. Prior to their arrival, Gainsborough had enjoyed many years of tranquillity, during which the former lord of the manor, Thomas Borough, had left the town to its own devices. This was not William Hickman's style. He burst onto the scene with great enthusiasm for his newfound role and immediately began interfering in the town's affairs. Used to the cut and thrust of London trade, he exploited his manorial rights in such an aggressive way that many of the townspeople turned against him. In fact, Sir John Thorold, an aristocrat whose ancestors had ruled Lincolnshire before the Norman Conquest in 1066, regarded William Hickman disdainfully as being nouveau riche and referred to him as a threadbare fellow. But there was an unexpected side to the Hickmans. William and his mother Rose, themselves former religious exiles, were sympathetic to the separatist movement, not the sort of man to be worried about public opinion or, indeed, harassment by the bishop. William allowed John Smith to hold his meetings in the hall. Smith's congregation soon reached 60 or 70. In 1605, the numbers increased dramatically when Richard Clifton was forced to resign from his Church of England post at Babworth, and many more separatists, including William Brewster, came from a wide area on both sides of the river to worship at the hall. In 1606, William Brewster set up a second separatist church in his home at Scrooby Manor. Those people who had been travelling many miles to join the Gainsborough congregation were now able to worship near a home. Richard Clifton became the pastor, and Brewster himself was the elder. The teacher was John Robinson, who was to become a leading figure in the separatist movement. Born in sturton le steeple near Scrooby in 1578, Robinson was a passionate separatist, very much in the Clifton and Brewster mould. As the resolve of the separatists strengthened, and as they became more and more determined to pursue their right to freedom of worship, so they came under more and more pressure. 
Far away from Babworth and Scrooby and Gainsborough, events were unfolding that would eventually force them to take the decisions that would so dramatically and drastically alter their lives. Early in 1604, the new monarch, King James I, called the Hampton Court Conference. Despite restrained pleas by the nonconformists for freedom of worship, the king declared, I will make them conform or I will harry them out of the land or else do worse. As a result of the conference, new decrees were implemented, including a ban on all private religious meetings. Conditions were increasingly threatening for separatist groups and punishments against them became severe. Local informers and government spies traveling the Great North Road soon brought the Scrooby Manor meetings to the notice of the Bishop of Lincoln and the Archbishop of York. The Scrooby group had been meeting for less than a year when the authorities struck. Some were imprisoned and others had their houses watched day and night. William Bradford wrote vividly of the persecution they experienced. They could not long continue in any peaceable condition but were hunted and persecuted on every side, so as their former afflictions were but as flea bitings of those which now came upon them. For some were taken and clapped up in prison, others had their houses beset and watched night and day and hardly escaped their hands. And the most were fain to flee and leave their houses and habitations and the means of their livelihoods. Brewster's daughter, born about this time, was baptized in the name of fear. The situation for both groups had become intolerable. Three stark choices began to emerge. Imprisonment, submission, or flight. For the first time, they began to talk seriously about abandoning their lives and livelihoods in England and fleeing to Holland, where they had heard there was freedom of religion for all men. A statute going back to King Richard II prohibited emigration without a license, so John Smith and at least 40 of his congregation, including his wife and two babies, slipped quietly away in the winter of 1607. Little is known of their journey, but from Gainsborough docks they could easily have boarded river barges bound down the Trent to Hull, from where they could have crossed anonymously to Holland. In Amsterdam, they joined up with about 300 other English separatist exiles, known by then as the Ancient Brethren. Not long after, and no doubt spurred on by the news of the Gainsborough Group's successful flight, the Scrooby congregation decided to follow. Their plan was to embark from the port of Boston, Lincolnshire, where Brewster had chartered a ship. With as much secrecy as possible, they gathered together their possessions and sold those things for which they had no further use. 50 or 60 people were to take ship downstream from Boston, here at Scotia Creek. Imagine how they felt as they stood here, cold, tired, anxious, no doubt, waiting to board, They'd given up everything to leave England, their property, their homes, their friends, their neighbours, to take up a new life in a land recently ravaged by war, whose language they did not understand, and where they would almost certainly face poverty and deprivation. And yet, they drew tremendous strength from their faith, their conviction. They were pilgrims, the Lord's anointed, and where he led, they must follow. In the event, their hopes were cruelly destroyed by the captain of the ship, who, unlike them, was apparently not a highly principled man. It is unlikely that he did what he did out of a sense of civic duty. Personal gain was more likely to have been the main reason why he betrayed the separatists. A report on the incident in Bradford's history states that... The captain took them in, but when he had them and their goods aboard, he betrayed them. Bailiffs put them into open boats and there rifled and ransacked them, searching them to their shirts for money, even the women. They carried them back to Boston and made them a spectacle in front of the multitude that came flocking on all sides. <laughs> 
having been rifled and stripped of their money, books, and much other goods by the catchpole officers, they were presented to the magistrates. We believe that some of them were held in the cells of Boston Guildhall. The magistrates treated them as kindly as possible, for Boston was a non-conformist town. Today it is still possible to see the cells on the ground floor in the Guildhall where some of the pilgrims were held during the trial. Brewster and his companions appeared before the magistrates in the courtroom on the floor above. After a month in prison, most were sent back to their own parishes. However, seven, including Clifton, Robinson, Brewster and Bradford, were put in the town jail to await trial at the Assizes in Lincoln. Eventually, under pressure from local sympathisers, they were released and, like the others, returned penniless to the Scrooby area for the winter. In the spring of 1608, a second and no less dramatic attempt to emigrate was made. Again, William Brewster contacted a Dutch ship owner, this time in Hull. He agreed to pick up the Scrooby separatists on a remote stretch of coast north of Grimsby known as Killingholm Creek. The escape plan shrouded in secrecy was for about 30 women and small children together with all the baggage to make their way from Bawtree along the River Idle to the tidal River Trent. Once on the Trent, they could then travel north to the Humber Estuary and the rendezvous with the men, who were to walk 40 miles overland from Scrooby. terrifying journey for the women. They assembled at dead of night, accompanied by whimpering, frightened children, knowing that the slightest noise might attract the attention of an informer and bring down a howling mob upon them. It's known that Mistress Brewster had with her a girl of seven or eight, as well as a newly born infant. John Clifton's wife was also there. Her husband had been deprived of his living at Babworth, she had given up one home then and was now giving up another. The barge arrived early at Killing Home and the seasick women pleaded with the crew to put into the shelter of a nearby creek. Unfortunately, by the time the Dutch ship arrived at low tide, the barge was aground on the mud and by this time the men had arrived and they were pacing anxiously up and down on the shore. The captain urged them to go aboard quickly so they would be ready to leave when the barge was lifted by the tide. One boat full did manage to embark and they were coming back for the rest. William Bradford's history tells us what happened next. The master espied a great company, both horse and foot, with bills and guns and other weapons for the country was raised to take them. The Dutchman, seeing it, swore his country's oath, sacramenti, and having the wind fair, weighed his anchor, hoist sails, and away. But the poor men which were got aboard were in great distress for their wives and their children, which they saw thus betaken, and were left destitute of their helps, and themselves also not having a clothe to shift them with, more than they had on their backs, and some scarce a penny about them, all they had being aboard the bark. For the men on board, worse was to come. A fearful storm broke out which carried the ship up the North Sea as far as Norway before it was able to turn back and head for Amsterdam. The conditions were so bad that the sailors themselves had given up hope at the height of the storm. The women and children, captive, homeless and miserable, were not in fact held for long and by August 1608, 
the last stragglers arrived in Amsterdam and were reunited with their families. John Smith and Richard Clifton, with many of their congregations, settled in Amsterdam. After only a few months, John Robinson and about a hundred of his followers, including William Brewster and William Bradford, moved to the small university town of Leiden, where they lived for the next 11 years. The stay in Holland was merely a respite before the epic journey that lay ahead. North America was chosen as the destination. A lengthy debate began about the wisdom of such a costly and dangerous journey. Eventually, those in favour of emigration won the day, and the arduous task of financing the voyage and getting royal assent for the colonisation began. After many months of difficult negotiations, a contract was drawn up with a group of businessmen known as the Merchant Adventurers, who were enthusiastic about exploiting the opportunities for trade then opening up in the New World. The Leiden Church, with money from the sale of properties and possessions, bought the Speedwell. This vessel was to carry some of them to America and would be used in their fishing enterprises. The adventurers, meanwhile, chartered the Mayflower, a ship of 180 tons, about 90 feet long and 24 feet wide. It was to join them at Southampton and would carry the bulk of the passengers, of whom there were 67 from various parts of England. On leaving Leiden, William Bradford said, So they left the goodly and pleasant city which had been their resting place near 12 years, but they knew they were pilgrims. It is to this comment of Bradford's that we can trace the origin of the expression Pilgrim Fathers. The Speedwell left Leiden in mid-July 1620 and so began the first stage of that epic journey. A whole church was on the move to a destination 3,000 miles away. It was a religious exodus which many have compared with the Hebrews' flight from Egypt. The Speedwell arrived in Southampton on or near the 22nd of July with 46 members of the Leiden congregation and tied up alongside the Mayflower at Southampton's West Quay. Before they could leave, a dispute with the merchant adventurers had to be resolved and some work done on the Speedwell, which was listing badly. All this meant further expense and delay. At last, they were ready to sail. They all gathered on the Mayflower and William Brewster read them John Robinson's farewell letter. Whereas you are to become a body politic, using amongst yourselves civil government, and are not furnished with persons of special eminency above the rest to be chosen by you into office of government, let your wisdom and godliness appear not only in choosing such persons as do entirely love, but also in yielding unto them all due honour and obedience in their lawful administrations, not beholding in them the ordinariness of their persons, but God's ordinance for your good. The spirit of this letter proved to be a guiding force, not only when they drew up their first article of government, but throughout the early history of the colony. On the 5th of August, 1620, the Speedwell followed the Mayflower into the English Channel. They had not gone very far when Captain Reynolds of the Speedwell reported that his vessel was leaking badly and he must put into Dartmouth for repair. The cost of this work forced the pilgrims to sell some of their precious provisions. Again they set sail, and this time they covered 300 miles before Captain Reynolds reported that the Speedwell was taking in so much water that they were in danger of sinking they had no choice but to put back into Plymouth, where, following a hurried conference, it was decided that the Speedwell would return to London with those passengers who had no further stomach for the voyage. Twelve of the Speedwell's passengers were to join the already overcrowded Mayflower. When those two little ships came bobbing into Plymouth Sound on that summer's day in 1620, they were heading towards a city with a distinguished history of seafaring. 
This was the city of Hawkins, of Drake, the city that defended the realm against the great Spanish Armada of 1588. It was a city that helped to create and defend an empire. And later, bravely and spectacularly, it defied Hitler. And he punished it mercilessly with a blitzkrieg that almost raised it to the ground. But from the moment those two apparently insignificant little ships arrived, Plymouth became known, above all, as the city that launched the Mayflower. Some of the buildings that greeted the Speedwell and the Mayflower as they arrived are still here. And there's a fascinating model of the city as it was in 1620 on display in the Preston House next to the parish church. The pilgrims had an unusual for them and pleasant experience in Plymouth. They were welcomed warmly. No one questioned their right to worship and no one threw them in jail. The point was that the people of Plymouth were perfectly at ease with strangers and adventurers. Many years later, the pilgrims were to write fondly of the hospitality they had received here. We don't know how long the pilgrims waited here in Plymouth with their ships tied up at the old Barbican. We think they stayed at Island House, now, fittingly, a tourist information centre. The master of the Mayflower was Christopher Jones. The pilgrims had made a wise choice. He was a highly qualified, very experienced and very well respected man of the sea. While the pilgrims waited and the ships were being provisioned, Captain Jones made good use of his time, collecting useful information in the quayside taverns from those brave sailors who knew the ferocious Atlantic and its capricious ways. These are the Mayflower Steps. It was from a spot just yards from here that the pilgrims finally set sail. Behind me, that monument commemorates that awe-inspiring embarkation. And now, almost 400 years later, people visit this monument from all over the world. The day came and the pilgrims took nervously to their little ship. A large crowd gathered. It was a great event, at least the equivalent of our own 20th century space voyages. In fact, it was more dramatic still. Wherever they were going, wherever the winds and Captain Jones would take them, they knew in their hearts that they would not be coming home. Worse, perhaps, was that the need to sail quickly had made any small hope of a trip to Scrooby to say farewell completely out of the question. This was the moment at which their faith in God and their belief in the justness of their cause was to be put to the test. And what a moment it was. They had sacrificed everything they owned for this uncertain voyage, and they were about to sail, though they could barely imagine it, 3,000 miles across a vicious sea in a pitifully small and, by today's standards, fearfully inadequate ship. They didn't pause for a moment. They set their faces to the sea, and waited for Captain Jones to call out his order to cast off. This was their faith. It became the faith of a mighty and supremely God-fearing nation. The little Mayflower moved quietly through the sheltered waters of Sutton Harbour. Once in a while, the pilgrims looked back at Plymouth, looked back at their slowly receding homeland,
and wondered for the hundredth time what would become of them. And again they turned back to the sea, praying for courage, and praying, no doubt, for deliverance. A favourable wind meant that they made good progress for the first few days, but in mid-Atlantic they were met by the full force of the equinoctial gales, which tore savagely at the little ship. The Mayflower fought bravely against the might of the storm until a huge wave crashed down upon it, causing serious damage. The record of the incident states, One of the main beams in the midships was bowed and cracked, which put them in some fear that the ship could not be able to perform the voyage. While the crew discussed whether they should continue, it was reported to them that the passengers from Holland had with them a large house-building jack intended for use in the colony. With it, they were able to secure the mast and enable the vessel to continue the voyage. Conditions on board became almost unbearable. Amongst bedding soaked with seawater, the patient women struggled to care for their children and the sick. The staple diet was salt horse, dried fish, cheese and beer. The only means of washing was with a bucket and with equally primitive sanitary arrangements, the stench down below was nauseating. Nevertheless, during the voyage, in spite of all this overcrowding and intense hardship, Mistress Hopkins gave birth to a son, aptly named Oceanus, and just one passenger, William Button of Osterfield, died. Just three days after Button's body had been committed to the sea, the Mayflower came in sight of land. It was perhaps a disappointment to the travel-weary passengers when the captain announced that this was possibly not the landfall they were intended to make under the terms of their charter. They were, in fact, a long way north of northern Virginia, their intended destination. Dutch interests had apparently persuaded Captain Jones to keep his ship well to the north. The Dutch, it seems, hoped themselves to develop the area now known as New York. The ship sailed along the coast, but finding those inland waters treacherous, soon turned northwards again and sailed round the tip of Cape Cod, dropping anchor in what is now Provincetown Harbour, nine weeks after leaving Plymouth. As they prepared to leave the ship and take their first tentative steps in the new world, it became apparent that there was disharmony among the passengers of the Mayflower. It was essential that these problems be resolved before anyone left the ship. The pilgrim leaders, with a masterly stroke of diplomacy, called the menfolk into the cabin of the Mayflower and presented them with the famous compact, which became the foundation document for the government of the colony. The very first American state paper was signed and sealed and became known thereafter as the Mayflower Compact. God. Amen. We whose names are underwritten, the loyal subjects of our dread sovereign lord, King James, by the grace of God of Great Britain, France, and Ireland, King, defender of the faith, etc., having undertaken for the glory of God and advancement of the Christian faith and honor of our king and country, a voyage to plant the first colony in the northern parts of Virginia. Do by these presents, solemnly and mutually in the presence of God and of one another, covenant and combine ourselves together into a civil body politic, for our better ordering and preservation and furtherance of the ends aforesaid, and by virtue hereof to enact, constitute and frame such just and equal laws, ordinances, acts, constitutions and offices from time to time as shall be thought most meet and convenient for the general good of the colony, 
unto which we promise all due submission and obedience. In witness whereof we have hereunder subscribed our names at Cape Cod, the 11th of November, in the year of the reign of our Sovereign Lord, King James of England, France and Ireland, the 18th, and of Scotland, the 54th, Anno Domini, 1620. It was a simple declaration of principles, but it provided the bedrock values of an infant democracy. Twenty years before, a flame had been lit, a flame that burnt throughout this remarkable story, fueled by the quiet courage and resolution of those single-minded pilgrims. And the flame would continue to burn, a beacon to guide and inspire future generations. People who, like their Mayflower forebears, would willingly struggle through disappointment and hardship in the pursuit of a life built above all on honest endeavour and the love of liberty.